So I did a video a couple of years ago, and I've learned so much since then that I thought it would be an absolute tragedy not to go back and make a better version of the video and teach you a little bit more about how it works. So the device that we are going to talk about today is the ground fault circuit interrupter, the GFCI. GFCIs are those little outlets that you expect to see around kitchen sinks, bathroom sinks, sometimes outside, laundry rooms, any area where there's water. In fact, you might have even seen one as a piece of an extension cord, and it's obvious from the test and reset buttons and the light that you see, just like any other GFCI outlet. So to illustrate this idea of why water can be so dangerous, imagine that you're standing at your bathroom sink after a shower and you're shaving using an electric razor. You accidentally drop the electric razor down into the water while the sink is running, and you reach down to retrieve it while you reach over to turn off the, the sink so that it doesn't get wet. Well, as you reach into the water, all the electricity that was coming through the cable, regardless of whether the razor is on or off at the moment, the electricity is now going through the water, energizing all of the water in that bowl. And now you, as you reach into the water. If possible, that current, the electricity, is going to try and find its way through you to get through your hand into the faucet, which if it's an old house, that faucet may be connected to metal pipes, which might likely be grounded. Now, it is possible that only a few, like 100 milliamps, which is about one-tenth of one amp, is enough to kill somebody. The circuit breaker is never going to trip at that point. It would take much more than that. But some people get really lucky. They can, around electricity, they might not get injured, they might not get hurt, but if the conditions are right, especially around water, it's much more likely for somebody to get injured or killed. So we all know that you've seen the outside of a GFCI outlet which whenever I take one apart, I always write a big X on it because I don't trust myself in putting them all back together. But what's inside the thing? Now, if we take off the outside cover and we take off the buttons and we take off the springs and we take off the contacts and we take off the top plate and we take off the bottom plate, what are we left with? Well, we're left with this piece inside. Now, this piece inside is a pretty fancy circuit board and they're actually a lot more complicated than I thought before I first took one apart. Figured how complicated could a GFCI outlet really be? Turns out, quite complicated. Now the basic principle of a GFCI is that we do not want any sort of current that goes through the hot or the neutral wires ever getting a chance to find another path to ground. If it finds another path to ground, even by a tiny amount, that path could be through you. So we want to be able to stop the flow of current if that ever happens. Well, how is a GFCI like this supposed to know when current is going to ground? Because if it goes to ground through somewhere else, we can't measure that, can we? We can't put a sensor on every single possible location. So we have to be able to compare the amount of electricity going through the two wires. And that's the power of this thing. Now, before we come back to this circuit board, I wanted to go take you to do a quick demonstration of how we can use the concept of sensing current to detect whether something is wrong in a wire that we're not even sensing. So let's go check out an example. I have behind me here a drill press. Now this drill press is rated with a motor of six amps. So that means that if I measure it with a current meter, I should be able to detect the amount of electricity that's going into this motor. So let me turn it on and make sure it's all powered up. Check to make sure everything's safe. Okay, so the drill press runs. Now it's not fully loaded, so I don't expect to see all six amps going through the motor, but let's see if we can make a measuring attachment that will allow us to be able to turn this motor on and be able to measure the amount of current going through the wires to it. So let's plug on our little test strip. So here is a cord that we built just for the sake of testing current. The two wires, the hot and the neutral, are separate from each other. So by using a standard clamp meter, I can clamp it around the hot wire and turn it on and set my meter to the millivolts. And I should be able to see a current reading. And this current reading that I see here says just shy of five amps. So on our six amp motor, that seems perfectly acceptable. Now, if I'm, I'm measuring the hot wire right now, I'm gonna switch over and check the neutral wire. So now I'm clamped onto the neutral wire and check this out. Here again, I have the same exact amount of current, 4.8. This says millivolts, but that's a conversion to amps. So again, just shy of five. Now that's measuring each wire separately. 
if I decide to measure both wires together with both wires passing through the forks, I see 0, 0.0, which means I have no current. Well, rather I measure zero current because alternating electricity passes through one wire and comes back the other wire. Regardless of how fast it's rotating, which is 60 hertz, there's always electricity going one way through the black wire and equal amount of electricity coming back through the white wire. So when we pass both of those through our measurement test coil, then we get a net of zero amps. Even though there is current traveling, quite a bit of current, five amps is a lot, but we don't get any measured current because of the fact that they're passing in both directions equal amounts. That's really important. Let's go back to the GFCI. And turn the, the drill press off so we don't have that noise constantly going in the background. Now what we just saw was an example of a current transformer. That's what the fork of a clamp meter is. It takes an amount of current that's traveling through the wires, transforms it down to a very safe level, but then converts it into a voltage that any meter or device is able to read. So if we take a look very closely on this board, what we're going to see right down here is a coil. Now that coil, which looks like two coils, but it's actually just two concentric coils, both of these big tabs, which are connected to our power terminals, are passing through the center of that coil. So that's the same as having both wires passing through my measurement clamp. These coils are a current transformer giving us an ability to test the amount of current passing through. Now, if the amount of electricity that comes in through the black hot wire and returns back through the neutral wire is exactly the same, what current is that coil going to measure? Zero. But if there is ever electricity that's going through the black wire and even a tiny amount of it, a few thousandths of an amp, is getting to ground somewhere, then that set, that, the amount coming back through the white wire will no longer be zero. That will start looking like an actual measurement value. Once the amount coming and going is not the same, a tiny amount of difference will be amplified, and that's an integrated circuit term. Amplifiers are a very common, very inexpensive circuit, but they can amplify that difference and amplify it enough to activate this coil down here, which is the click that you hear when you test the GFCI and it disengages. Now there's another really interesting thing about these GFCIs too. When they are energized, so that means not tripped, they are reset, they are working properly, then these two tabs on the side, one side and the other, are pulled up to meet the copper tabs here at the very bottom. These copper tabs supply electricity to the two bottom terminals. Those two bottom terminals are what go off to the rest of the circuit. You'll notice that if you ever connect one, you'll see on the back of it, it says line, and then the one that's taped over says load. That's why we have to be very careful to which one we attach it to, because the line is the one that's doing the measurement. The load is the one that will be shut off if it senses any imbalance of current. So those are the ones that we pass everything downstream to. So when they say that GFCIs are able to protect all the outlets downstream, that's how they're able to do that. Those two tabs on the side of this one not only connect the circuits downstream, but they also connect to this top plate, these two little brass pads right here, which are the actual springs where we plug our stuff into in the actual GFCI outlet. So that protection not only works to disable the outlet itself, but all the outlets downstream. So that means it's really important that we have to know which of the outlets is the first one so that we can put the GFCI on that one. If you have no idea which outlet is the first and last in the series, sometimes it's safer to just put a GFCI at each one of those outlets. Although granted they are a lot more expensive, but you're guaranteed protection factor is a whole lot higher if you take those extra precautions. So one last thought on these GFCI outlets is that they have this test and the reset button. You want to make sure to test them regularly. Now it says right here printed in plastic test monthly. I don't know that anybody that I know including myself actually really holds to a schedule of walking around their house once a month to test all of their GFCI outlets. 
But you can certainly see that since these outlets are intended for wet locations, circuit boards like that are really susceptible to moisture problems. So of any outlet in your house, the one that's most likely to encounter a moisture issue is the one that's doing the protection for you in case of an emergency. So if there's any one that you want to test, it's definitely going to be these ones. So make sure to go and press that test button, which allows a little trickle of current to go to ground to make sure that it is working properly and then press the reset button to make sure that it does reset properly. And that way you know you're safe. The LED is also a good indicator for that. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Again, this one's my first remake. I'm probably not gonna do that very much, but these ones are just so interesting and I do so much electrical work with replacing them uh, that it seemed like it would be a, a terrible tragedy to miss out on such a good video and to do it better than I did last time. So I hope you, ha hope you had fun. Uh, and if you get a chance, go break some stuff yourself. You'll learn more about it. And as always, go build something awesome.